Britain. Uh, you know, I, I've heard of uh, transgender politicians and also some legislation regarding transgenders. But it's, um, it's, this is kind of different. This is um, under Indian law, you're creating a third gender. A third gender. Mm. Well, that could solve things, um, you know, uh, short term. Uh, but in the long term, what I fear with creating a third gender is that, number one, I have to sell that idea to the conservatives. They will never admit that. Number two, uh, it is like creating a new class of people that might be subjected to discrimination on the basis of there being a third gender. Uh, they might be subjected to othering. So I'd rather be wary and, and observe first what happens in India. It's solved, it has solved a lot of problems, especially the CR issue, but personally I'm also in favor of using a, a third bathroom, okay? But under no circumstances, I think I should be obliged to enter a men's bathroom. You just might run out of the bathroom if I enter <laughs> your bathroom. We have another question over there. Uh, good evening, Congresswoman. Good evening. I just want to ask if you plan to revise the Soji bill. And do you think um, what particular part of the bill does the Senate uh, like didn't want? That's why they didn't pass it. There is a controversial provision in the Senate which they have already amended. Um, this is the part about religious speech. So according to the critics of the bill, they say that the Senate version will allow uh, the state to prosecute those who teach that homosexuality is a sin. Uh, but that has been removed, that has been modified. In the lower house's version, we respect uh, religious freedom as well as religious speech and the right um, of, uh, to express one's religious beliefs. No? So it's, you won't get prosecuted if you teach that homosexuality is a sin. Or uh, you won't get prosecuted even if you think that I'm an abomination in the eyes of the Lord and that uh, I'm the daughter of Satan, the son of Satan. But you will get prosecuted if you use that belief to violate my constitutional right to work or to study. If I, you, you fire me because I'm a homosexual, even though I'm a qualified employee, of course you should be prosecuted. This is um, the, 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 uh, the provision that was quite controversial in the Senate. Uh, I'm gonna, there, there are more questions here, but that links closely to a question asked online, uh, which is, what has been the most fulfilling challenge you've overcome so far in your career? I'm going to translate this into, is this therefore your challenge, the Soji Bill? Is this, do you see it as, like when you've solved this, when you've crossed this over, what are the other bills, or what are, what's the next, you know? I'd rather not consider the Soji Equality Bill as my greatest challenge. Although I'm beginning to think it is a very, very big challenge. Um, one just has to manage his or her expectations if we don't want to end up jaded or frustrated or disappointed. Um, the good thing is that even if an anti-discrimination bill is not passed on the national level, at least there are many, as we speak, there are more and more local government units that are passing anti-discrimination ordinances. Today, there are at least around 25, and the number is increasing. Uh, the sad thing is that you will have cities or towns where equality is recognized, but other cities and towns where LGBT people are not protected, okay? So what would be my greatest challenge? Honestly speaking, the, bill that is, the bills that are coming up on Tuesday, which is agrarian reform, as well as the creation of a Department of Rural Development are even greater challenges because this is like systemic changes in the Philippines already. And of course, I know that I'm up against a very strong lobby, but I want to assure everyone that I want to strike a balance when it comes to agrarian reform. My ultimate goal when it comes to agrarian reform is not land ownership, it is food security. So I will admit other formulas, 
other formulas that will make that ultimate goal possible. And then, the Department of uh, Rural Development, you know what? Uh, in the wake of this very uh, controversial law, which according to the opinion of many farmers and farmers groups is quite detrimental to them, um, I want a separate department that will coordinate all efforts for farmers and that will uh, take um, uh, food security as its main priority. I do hope the landlords in the room are listening. <coughs> um, I think we have another question from the... You why may ask this about the, yes, the very important bill if you want to. Yes, and then the, there is a question here, but I think we have a question from the... Thank you so much, Congresswoman Geraldine. I'm a millennial and a huge fan of yours. Um, so something I wanted to ask you about, um, it's kind of been in the political and pop culture atmosphere is cancel culture. Um, so when, you know, even from my personal experience, you know, as a woman or as an Asian, when I receive discrimination from somebody else, you know, there are times when I feel confident enough or safe enough to have a discussion with them, a conversation as we're having tonight, but there are also other times where the offense might just be a little too severe that I don't want to talk to them about it. So you've spoken a lot to the night about striking this balance. Um, so I'm wondering how you you kind of walk that line, right? And um, how you navigate conversations, you know, how you determine whether somebody's coming from a place of ignorance or somebody's coming from a place of malice, and how you kind of how you kind of navigate those conversations. Thank you. Okay, for, for everyone's clarity, you know, there is a culture called cancel culture among the millennials. Are you familiar with this culture? So, young people tend to be overly idealistic. So because maybe of social media. Sometimes social media gives you a false perception of the world. No, it's artificial, as if everything were perfect. Everybody posts on Instagram, you know, perfect food, perfect places to go to, etc., clothes, etc. It's kind of superficial and artificial. And everybody, every young, young millennial seems to believe that we live in, a, uh, you know, life is a better process. It is not. Um, so when they have these ideals, they cannot manage their expectations of other people. So, let's say in my case, okay, I was, let's say, um, I, I broke the glass ceiling, they say, oh, she's a trans woman, so she has to be progressive, and therefore, these are the series of expectations that she has to live up to. So, on the basis, probably, of one pronouncement or one decision, they will immediately cancel you. You're out of my vocabulary. I don't deal with you anymore. This is cancel culture, and I don't believe in that because it is unrealistic. You'll only end up frustrated. You see, we human beings are complex. Like in my case, some people are surprised I still hold on to my Catholic faith. Well, this is nothing not conventional according to them. Why should it be? Right? And then, you see, if I were to adopt that cancel culture in my work as Congresswoman, nobody will vote for my measures. I would be constantly judging my fellow congressmen and congressmen. Oh, yeah, I don't talk to you because uh, you are not in favor of farmers' rights. Or I don't talk to you because you voted in favor of the death penalty. Or I don't talk to you because you made this very misogynist comment about women. I mean, where will I end up? Zero bills passed. And that's my only deliver deliverable. You see, life, to manage yourself through life, you have to practice the art of empathy and sympathy. You have to understand why people think or act that way and try not to be judgmental because Sometimes, if you have a little bit of humility and you're open-minded, you will discover that, well, this is the reason why this person thinks or acts this way. And then maybe 
I, understanding that person more, I can try to sway him over to my side. I think that is a more practical approach and attitude in life. So this cancel culture cannot exist anymore. As President Obama said, well, he recently spoke against the cancel culture. Uh, it's not real. You will only end up disappointed. Did I answer your question? In real life, for us to survive and to get and reach our goals, we have to have more empathy, more understanding, more humility, and more openness to the differences that exist between hum among human beings. Um, sabi ko nga, I've been saying, you know, even from the LGBT community, we want other people to understand well, our somewhat different nature. Well, we should also be able to practice what we preach by understanding, you know, no, different personalities, different opinions, different whatever. We are all different. Um, thank you so much for extreme opinions about equality, you know? but uh, I am sure we'll hear some of them. You know? But before we delve into that, let's hear first from the person who has tirelessly spearheaded this wonderful event, the first ever Notables at AIM. A round of applause for the MBM 95 batch representative, Mark Ablaza. <laughs> On behalf of MBM class of 1995, I welcome you all to the launch of Notables at AIM. Thank you, Sergeant Cuesta, for telling us what Notables at AIM is. Now, let me tell you about how it came to be. My two years in AIM from 93 to 95 were among the best I've had. I've learned much and made lifelong friends. AIM was known then as the premier business school in the region. But I've heard lately that those years are now referred to as the glory days of AIM. And it is no longer what it used to be. I happen not to believe that. What I believe is that AIM's best years are still up ahead. And it is this belief that prompted MBM 95 to mount this passion project. A multi-pronged endeavor geared toward accomplishing the following. Number one, to shine the spotlight on AIM to draw people in to expand and fortify the AIM community. Number two, to showcase the value that an AIM education adds to individuals. And number three, in its course, to raise scholarship, funds for scholarships. Notables of AIM, a non-traditional speaker series, is a passion project. Because mounting this was an arduous process from the onset. It was met with a good measure of doubt and was slow to gain support. Why non-traditional? What's the topic? What is it for? Why controversial speakers? Were a few of countless questions cast its way? Please allow me to answer them now. It is non-traditional because it is so much more than just a talking to of a speaker to an audience. Notables at AIM is a conversation, allotting equal time to speaker, for the speaker and audience to have a purposeful and meaningful exchange. The topic is a narrative that the speaker delivers. It is never singular nor definitive. It is an amalgam of the speaker's opus vitae, or life's work. Its purpose is for a community to come together to propel actions and solutions for nationhood. It is controversial because it seeks to engage speakers courageous enough to champion unpopular, 
burdensome or Herculean causes to spur intelligent discourse on polarizing issues. But who would such a speaker be? He must be passionate, non-traditional, controversial, courageous, and with a stellar opus vitae to show for it. We of MBM 95 belabored this. Then I remember the hype surrounding the latest search for a new James Bond to replace Daniel Craig. A journalist asked Pierce Brosnan, who do you think the next James Bond should be? The journalist then proceeded to rattle off the shortlisted actors such as Idris Elba and James McAvoy. Pierce Brosnan answered, I think we've watched the guys do it for the last 40 years. Get out of the way, guys, and put a woman up there. And that is exactly what we did. We found our very own Bond, who with zero hesitation, immediately obliged. So allow me to present to you, with awe and honor, the first female graduate of the Ateneo High School, the first transgender woman elected to the Congress of the Philippines, representative of the 1st District of Bataan. She is recognized by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 leading global thinkers of 2016 and Time Magazine's Inspiring Women of 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome my classmate and seatmate for four years at the Ateneo, my dear friend, the Honorable Geraldine Roman. a more coordinated approach in the fight against cancer 
through research, prevention, accessible treatment, and support services to people who suffer from cancer. So that is also something that I am proud of. And right now, I am embroiled in the fight against single-use plastics in Congress. Just yesterday, I delivered a very passionate speech appealing to my colleagues to take this fight not only from an environmental point of view, but from a health point of view. And I seem to have convinced them. And on Tuesday, I will actually embark on a major campaign to extend our country's agrarian reform program, something that is very controversial, as well as the creation of a department of rural development in the wake of the problems that our farmers are having in our country. So here I am today, talking about gender equality. <laughs> but I can't say no. First of all, because it's my dear classmate, it was my dear classmate who invited me over. And I was curious, you know, because normally my audience comes from the younger crowd. I, uh, it seems that I have a following among uh, university students, among millennials. Not that I'm saying that you're all old. <laughs> And to millennials, the gender issue is very important, surprisingly. You know, it forms part of that millennial mentality of being authentic to oneself. So when we talk about gender, it's a big issue for them. And that gives me hope. That gives me hope because, you know, in the wake of the Gretchen Diaz case or the controversy that involved a trans woman who was verbally and physically harassed after she tried to use the ladies' bathroom in a mall in Cobal. After that backlash where, you know, there were a lot of people whom I did not expect turned out to be very, well, prejudiced. A lot of colleagues who turned out to be bigoted. I was very, very disappointed. But, you know what? Seeing that there are millennials gives me hope. And I know that somehow the gender equality issue will also strike a chord in your hearts. Many people ask me, how can, you know, actually you were discussing this other day, Mark. My staff was asking me, Ma'am, how can you appeal to a gra group of gra uh, graduates, uh, graduates uh, of the AIM who are often, you know, thinking about making money. How? <laughs> Why would gender equality be significant or relevant to you? Well, it is because I know that while you are busy enriching yourselves and your companies, you also want to create a society that will be better for your children. This is how I view gender equality. And a society that will provide equal opportunities to all people. You know, sometimes people ask me, Geraldine, why do you even have to fight for gender equality? I mean, people recognize you as a woman. You're respected. Um, so far, nobody has been very disrespectful to me. Um, you already have your name legally changed. I mean, physically, you already have the attributes of a woman, and a pretty one at that. Yeah. But I often answer them, but life is not about just enjoying your privileges. Life is about enabling others to enjoy those privileges. And I would like to think that our business sector our experts in economy, our experts in business, also have that vision in mind. Creating a society where people have equal opportunities, equal protection under the law, equal recognition, regardless of number one, their sex. 
You know, this has been the struggle of women for the longest time. To be recognized in the workplace, in government, in all spheres of society, regardless of your age. You know, whenever I hear in the Philippines that companies are actually excluding 30 plus year old qualified people or those in their 40s or a very healthy 50 year old from work, they're being excluded. I cannot understand that. It is lost potential. Or regardless of their religion, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their physical appearance. You know, we Filipinos are very infamous. We are kind of cruel when it comes to judging other people on the basis of their physical appearance. That should stop on the basis of their health status and so on and so forth. If we are willing to fight against discrimination on the basis of these personal circumstances that have nothing to do with one's capacity to work, why are we not able as a society to fight against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and expression? That is my big question. Why? Is it so difficult to recognize that there are men and women who just happen to be gay or lesbian or transgender like myself or who happen to express themselves in ways that are non-conventional? Maybe they dress differently, they wear their hair differently. But I have to insist this, these circumstances are not chosen, and these circumstances are irrelevant, especially when looking for a job or qualifying for a post in government. They should not be used as criteria in determining who should receive services from the government or who should be able to enter a public establishment like a hotel or a restaurant. So, if we are willing to fight for equality, we should also include sexual orientation and gender identity and expression as one of the reasons why we should not discriminate against other people. So, for the past three years, people have also known me as one of the champions of what we call the anti-discrimination bill based on SOGI, or the Soji Equality Bill. I remember, Mark, during the 17th Congress, it was a much celebrated bill. It was passed unanimously in the lower house. And it encountered a problem in the Senate, which is controlled by the conservatives. So it died in the 17th Congress. But in the 18th Congress, the Soji Equality Bill is encountering a lot of challenges, even more challenges. Because things are such that our House leadership is quite conservative. And the leaders, you know, the deputy speakers are also conservative. So really, I'm trying to manage my expectations when it comes to the passage of this bill. And then we also now encountered another challenge in the wake of the Gretchen Diaz case. There was an orchestrated smear and fear campaign. Now, the battles are being waged not only in the halls of Congress, but also on social media. You know, we hear of fake news. The queen of fake news actually orchestrated this. Do you know who the queen of fake news here is in, in the Philippines? I think some of you do, right? It's like an ice cream flavor. Okay, so they were spreading fake news and lies about the Soji Equality Bill. What it is not. First of all, what is the Soji Equality Bill? So that, yeah, you might understand what it really is. It is simply an anti-discrimination bill that seeks to protect Filipinos who just happen to be LGBT from discrimination at the workplace, in schools, in the delivery of government services, 
as well as its access to commercial and public establishments. It also seeks to guarantee that Filipinos who happen to be LGBT will not be insulted in the streets, that they will be outed without their consent, and other things that are normally taken for granted by straight people. So the accusations have been very many. They say that the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity and Expression Equality Bill is same-sex marriage. It is not. May I invite all of you to read the bill. Even if you comb through the entire bill, you will find no reference whatsoever to same-sex marriage or marriage equality. In fact, in one of the provisions where there was reference to professional licenses, it states that in the issuance of professional licenses, there should be no discrimination. We were careful to specify that these do not refer to marriage licenses. This is a request of one of the opponents of the bill, as if marriage licenses were professional licenses, right? But we heeded uh, his suggestion. We um, um, uh, gave in to his suggestion, and we included this in the bill. Another accusation is that it will infringe and it will violate the religious freedom of well, some people, certain beliefs. How do you define religious freedom? You know, I find it quite hypocritical that people actually well, believe that religious freedom is the right to insult, to criticize, to judge, and to discriminate. That is not religious freedom. And then, the irony of it all is that when you call out these people who practice their religious freedom to criticize and discriminate, and you remind them that you are violating, they are violating your constitutional right, they call that religious persecution. You see? Deep inside, I feel that they are not really against religious persecution. They just want to make sure that they're the ones doing it. So another accusation is that children will be able to choose their gender. I'm sorry to say that this bill is not a gender recognition law. Children will still be identified as male or female depending on their set of genitals at birth. And that will be their birth certificate. And the law does not allow you to change it. So these are the lies that they're spreading, that they are spreading. They even say that the Soji Equality Bill will curtail academic freedom. It will not. You can teach whatever you want in universities. But of course, another thing is when you incite people to violence against a certain group of people who should be protected under the law. I would say that the Soji Equality Bill is a beautiful bill with clean intentions. The thing is that people are scared. And the opponents of this bill try to capitalize on that fear, fear of the unknown. It's but natural. It's human psychology. When you do not understand a certain phenomenon or why a person is that way, you tend to treat him um, differently. That is what you call othering. And somehow, when you treat them differently, you invent this kind of justification to yourself. But if we have to be strict about it, we have to be reminded that the other person we are talking about is a fellow Filipino citizen and a human being who has inherent rights and who has civil and legal rights that have to be protected. I wish life were simpler. This is what the opponents of this bill want to have. I wish life were simpler, that there are only straight men and straight women. But we are here. We are here. And to those who will say, no, you chose to be that way. My God, I did not choose to be transgender. Nobody in his 
or her right mind would actually choose to be transgender. Imagine being born in what you perceive to be a long body. In my case, I was born with the anatomy of a boy, but with the heart and mind of a woman. I did not choose this. If I had a choice, I would choose to be like Marco Blasa. I'd be a macho man. I'd get married. I'd have several children. I might even have a mistress or two, right? <laughs> and enjoy it. <laughs> oh, nothing personal, Mark. <laughs> but I was born this way. I have to make the best out of it. And I also know that there are gay men and gay women who are just trying to survive in this quite cruel world. You know, they say that the Philippines is a very tolerant country. They say that, you know, LGBT people are already accepted in our country. But I have to question that, especially in the wake of what happened to Gretchen Diaz. To tell you the truth, when I was reading the comments on social media, how stupid of me, right? I shouldn't be reading social media on uh, comments. When I was reading through the comments, I really felt sad deep inside. And I was asking myself, is this the society that we live in? And I went a step further and asked myself again, is this the society that we want to leave our children? Is this the society that we dream of? My hope is that you people, you have the, what we call in the Philippines, mataas ng pinag-aralan, you have higher education, you've traveled, you will open your hearts and minds to the fact that there are people who may have different sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. But these people, have to be treated with dignity and respect. And their rights have to be guaranteed under the law. This is my struggle. I will continue it. And I hope you will accompany me too in the fight for equality and reaching that society where everyone is welcome despite his or her differences. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, well, she said everything already. Um, but it is interesting that you spoke about uh, agrarian reform. You spoke about those, all those other concerns of yours. No, but what's interesting is that agrarian reform and gender equality, while they may seem like very different things, they really deal with one simple thing, equality. Social justice. Yes, and social, social justice. justice. Um, but, obviously, since you've encountered a lot of, um, shall we say, challenges no, on, the, on the road, no? the concept, obviously, of equality and social justice is not simple with other people. No? And this is why we're opening this Q&A to everybody. We opened it, in fact, to uh, a Facebook community, which is the most dangerous thing you can do. <laughs> and, I'm, in fact, I'm going to dangerously say the page again. No? Uh, notables AIM95. You know, that's the way. You can you just, if you want to be anonymous about it, if you don't want to raise your hand, you can post your questions there and then we'll call you out anyway. Um, but of course, I'll open it to the floor. But interestingly enough, I'd like to start with a, with a little cuento, just a fun cuento, because, uh, Sir Mark, you, you were classmates before. I was in San Francisco just a few weeks ago, where besides uh, a case of late middle age chicken box, I caught up with uh, a friend of mine who we bumped into, and we bumped into a friend he introduced me to, this gorgeous girl, this gorgeous woman. And the woman said, I know you, I know you. And then I realized that she was my high school classmate too. And she was so gorgeous that, uh, she was totally gorgeous, and I had my son with me, and we explained to my son, I told my son that she was my classmate before. And interestingly enough, my son, who's nine years old, immediately understood. And I consider that a victory, not just 
for me as a parent, because I'm going to take it. No? Every victory of a son is a parent's victory, but for my son as well. So I'm going to open the floor to any questions. Uh, somebody will pass you a mic, just raise your hand. I have a couple of questions from Facebook, but perhaps we should start live with questions from the floor. Oh, there's one here, sir. Hi, uh, Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Jeremy Newman, and Pastor Jason, if you can remember from the event in LGBT event in USMC from Metropolitan Community Church, Marikina. Recently, I talked about uh, SOGI 101 in our uh, elementary school in Barangka, Marikina. And one of the questions there was uh, Is it true that uh, trans people will be forced, uh, will be uh, accepted for Sydney in exclusive schools. So, okay. For all practical purposes and those who fear that there may be a deluge of trans men trying to enter the Ateneo. Well, Ateneo now is uh, co-ed. Okay. What's another all male boys? So, savior. Savior High School. Or those who might fear that there be a group of, um, no, trans women entering the Savior and trans men entering, I don't know, Miriam? Is Miriam co-ed? It is co-ed now? Assumption, okay. What would be the first requirement of a school when you apply? A birth certificate. So a birth certificate is something that is given to you. Uh, you have your assigned sex, sex at birth. So if, uh, your birth certificate says that you're a male, you cannot enter a subshop, and vice versa. If it says that uh, you are female, you cannot enter Savior School. So for all practical purposes, it, is, it, is, it, won't, uh, it won't pose a problem. Really. Now, the question is, for example, uh, you have a student in high school, and then that person finally accepts his or her gender identity, what would you do? Let's say, for example, in Savior School, you have a student who's quite effeminate, and then I finally comes to grips with um, his, her gender identity, and says that I identify as a woman, and this is really my reality, I didn't choose this. I, what would you do? Um, do they still wear a uniform in Savior School? They do. Anyway, women wear trousers, it could be considered a gender neutral um, uniform. Okay, now let's go to the other case. What if it were Assumption uh, College and then the student comes out as um, male, as a gender identity male? What should the school do if the student requests the administrators to allow him to wear trousers instead of a skirt. This is how I view it. Every school has the right to develop its uniform policy. But above that policy is the school's mandate to deliver the constitutional right to education, which is more important. What would the school lose if it allows that student to wear trousers? Anyway, women wear trousers in real life. So what would why make a big deal out of it? I think the school should focus more on allowing that student to learn and to develop his potential and become a good citizen for the future. I don't know if you agree with this. This is how I view things. You have to place them on a balance. A uniform policy and rules in general are there to serve as human beings. It's not the other way around. We were not made to serve rules, but rules were made to serve us. Thank you so much for that. I just want to link that with something that was sent over on Facebook. Because it's interesting that you mentioned that these are all, I went to Ateneo also, and these are all Catholic schools, no? Miriam, Ateneo, Savior. But you know what? Yeah. You go now to a Catholic school like Ateneo yeah. or Miriam, they actually allow trans students already to dress the way they are comfortable with. Um, for example, I have read of a recent case in Ateneo de Naga. Naga, he was a batchmate of ours, father, 
Robert Rivera, Robert Rivera, um, there was a student who was a trans woman, and uh, one of the teachers said, oh, you cannot graduate if you wear women's clothing. But she, and she looks like a woman, she asks if it was a woman, identifies as a woman. She passed, I mean, so she, she approached the university president, who was, who was our classmate, Father Rivera, Robert Rivera, and then Father Robert Rivera allowed her to graduate in uh, women's clothing. No? So, no problem, no big deal, really. That's a great example also because the question was, um, has the church been supportive? I, I'm sure of, of the LGBT, uh, uh, LGBT, uh, LB, LGBTQI community. Well, no? you know, we are products of uh, the Jesuits. <laughs> Yeah, the and Jesuits are very open-minded. In fact, there yeah. is one Jesuit priest who is championing the LGBT cause worldwide. This is Father James Martin. You might want to look him up in, on Facebook. Father James Martin. He's very open-minded. Um, his belief is that, you know, there are LGBT Catholics, and they are valid, and God loves them, and you have to reach out to them. But you don't exactly reach out to them by openly condemning them. You'll be, you know, uh, just scaring them away. So, Catholic Church in general, it depends. I know that the Dominicans at the University of uh, Santa Tomas do not allow uh, trans people. You know, it's easier for gay men and gay women if they keep quiet about their sexuality. They might be a little bit effeminate, but you know, nobody can outrightly accuse them of being gay or gay or you're lesbian. But for trans people, you know, um, dressing up according to whom we are is, is part of us. It's important to us. Just as the way you dress is part of your self-expression of who you are. So it's a problem for the University of Santa Tomas, no? They don't allow trans students. And then the justification is that they say that, oh, no, uh, this is against Catholic dogma, you know. Uh, they say that, uh, uh, well, they do not even recognize that there are transgender people. They just say that homosexuals are naturally disordered. This is according to the Catholicism of the Catholic Church. But then again, I mean, they should be looking at themselves in the mirror, right? I know of a lot of gay priests, which is not bad. The thing, what is confusing to me, though, is that you know already what it is to be a homosexual, and yet you condemn other people of the same condition. So, my point of view is that if you want to be strict with those who violate, you know, uh, church teaching, then you have to be strict in all cases. Those who engage in premarital sex, for example, those who, I don't know, um, go to communion without the one hour fast. I mean, let's be consistent, right? Why do you have to single out LGBT people? So I find that quite unfair. Now, as a Catholic, I have been very open about this. I am a practicing Catholic. My community, my faith community, accepts me at least in Bataan, which is not to say I've encountered uh, members of the hierarchy who don't want to rub, rub elbows with me or who have condemned me openly. But in the end, really, one's faith and one's spirituality is something very personal. It's, it's between you and that divine, and the divine, you see. So no matter how much they may criticize me, I'm quite secure, I'm quite secure. This is how I view my being transgender with my being Catholic. My journey as a trans person is a journey of being true to oneself. Others may argue, oh no, biologically speaking, you are a male because in terms of your chromosomes, you are an X and a Y, you are not a double X. But since when have we dealt with other people using our chromosomes? <laughs> Since when have we come up with our own identity using our chromosomes? We don't. 
We use our minds and our hearts and just try our best to live a life of normalcy given our limitations and capacities. So my journey as a trans person is, I don't know, could be God's work in progress, could be a journey towards being true to myself. Now if tomorrow I grew a beard which it won't grow, well, it won't grow anymore, or I wore slacks and tried to, that would be faking it. Would you rather deal with somebody who's like, Or would you rather deal with somebody who is authentic, at least, and being true to his self, himself or herself? This is how I reconcile being Catholic and being transgender. I think this also uh, places the church at a very great moment you know, in the journey of the church itself. So uh, I think we have a question from... I'm from India. And in India, you have a lot of transgender people who have made a difference. And uh, in uh, the southern state of Kerala, the place called Kochi, and three years back, they opened a school for the transgender students, and they graduated under the. Well, my daily dealings with my constituents, I see a lot of farmer groups and farmers. I've met them. I've seen how difficult their lives are, but at the same time, I look back towards my experience in Spain. I lived in Spain for 22 years. And I see that their farmers and their fishermen lead rather comfortable lives. And I keep asking myself, why is it possible in the developed world for farmers to be able to buy a car, to save money, to send their children to decent schools, to wear nice clothing, to save money and travel? And how come here in our own country, our farmers, my gosh, it's a hand-to-mouth existence. And we've talk, been talking for so long about empowering our farmers and their rights and everything and this crazy law and everything. You know what I'm referring to, right? The rights clarification law. And yet nothing is happening. Um, I believe in we reform, but I, I want to change the approach. I want food security rather than land ownership at all. I mean, what's the point of giving a piece of land to a farmer? He won't be able to develop it and grow his business as a farmer. What's the point if we do not extend support services to him? What's the point if we aim to give him a piece of land when it takes 30 years before a case is finally settled and our justice system, our grand justice system, is an etern a, a, a last an eternity? What is the point? So it is a challenge and I look back at my experience in Spain, if, it, if they can do it, I compare the Philippines with Spain because, you know, we were under Spain for nearly 400 years. Um, our society is structured in such a way that it was like Spain before the Civil War. There was a very strong, you know, uh, divide, big divide between rich and the poor, very few rich people, no middle class, and many poor people. I'm not saying that we need a civil war, right? <laughs> but uh, this is why it tickles and piques my interest. And I want to take this on, but I want to assure everyone, I'm going to listen to everyone. As I say, you have to listen to all opinions and then possibly discover that right formula uh, for our country. That's how we approach things. Thank you so much. We have more questions from the floor, but I just want to go here because I want to enter this area because um, I think it's rooted, your, your strong opinions and the challenges you choose, as you mentioned already, are rooted in othering. The, far, the farmer, no? the, 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 the farmer is other, is the other. To us, especially here, very educated people. No? And it's interesting because the questions that are asked, there are a lot of questions online that are quite specific. And uh, for example, ano mo sa niyo sa mga school at companies na may masculinity test? Well, I didn't even know. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I might feel this. Uh, is it okay? Well, in some okay? small private schools, to determine yes. if a child has homosexual tendencies, they actually conduct a masculinity test. How is this test? I, I've never heard of this. I've never. Really, it's so absurd, I cannot imagine what it consists of, really. <laughs> I don't know. 
they will throw a, no, a, a rubber lizard to you, and then if you shriek, oh, I, see. <laughs> I would, I would definitely say that. Or they will ask you, can you look at your elbow? So if you're a man and you look at your elbow like this, or I don't know, can you look at your nails? If you look at your nails like this, I don't know, or like this, I don't know really what the masculinity or femininity test is. It's so absurd. It's really absurd because I don't know if this is a hypothetical question. It does happen. It does. And thank God, it's you know, slowly disappearing. <laughs> yeah. Um... Because you know what? Uh, I've met quite a feminine men, but they're straight. And I've met men who are very masculine, but they're gay. You really cannot determine on the basis of a test what the sexuality or the identity of a person is. But what the law, what the bill says, is that you cannot conduct these tests so that's because they're irrelevant. Yeah. Now, if it were a test on reading comprehension, or I don't know, some sort of uh, skill that is relevant to learning, yes, that is very valid. But the masculinity and femininity test, I mean, what does it have to do? So, it's not okay. It's not okay, and if the bill is passed, it's going to be illegal. Yes, and um, um, in fact, the larger question there, and this is very interesting, what's your advice? On, and, and, and I'm sure we have a lot of business owners here, people who manage businesses, who run enterprises. So what is your advice on getting businesses and enterprises started on inclusivity and anti discrimination? This is a great question. I mean, you know, the, uh, several months ago, they invited me over at Shell Corporation. It's a very inclusive company. They were very proud. You know, in that company, um, uh, I've met a lot of uh, gay men and lesbian women and some transgenders. They were very happy. Um, they didn't have to hide anything. Of course, they observed proper office decorum. And they were allowed to dress the way that they were, you know, they identify with. And um, in other words, it was no big deal for the company. And they even extended uh, insurance benefits, uh, you know, permits to, to, to leave, no, uh, to take a leave to same-sex couples. And the result was that, well, I interviewed the employees. They were all happy. And they wanted to retire in that company and, and be productive. They were inspired to work. I mean, how often do you find a company like that? So they strive hard and they excel. And it's a win-win solution, really. It's a win-win situation. Uh, it's a way of, uh, uh, that's fidelization, you call that, uh, making your employees. Their turnover was very low. It was a happy place. That's what I can say. They even have this, um, uh, they had Pride Month. You know, they had Women's Month and Pride Month. Okay. I just remember this comment I heard recently. Why celebrate Pride Month? Pride is one of the seven mortal sins. <laughs> that was so absurd. Anyway, that didn't come from a uh, high-ranking official, right? Sure, I'm sure they have to take a masculinity test. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I think we have a question on the floor. Yes. Two questions, sir. Um, hi, good evening. I'm Nandisa, and I'm part of LGBT. Um, recently, I've asked my um, insurance company if I can add my partner as my beneficiary, and, then it didn't, and they said no. Um, my question is, is there any way or any help from the Saudi bill to um, for the LGBT couples to have the same benefits of a, of a normal couple? And if not, what's your opinion about it? Well, the Sochi Equality Bill will not address that specific situation because it is not a bill that will legally recognize your relationship. Um, you see, insurance benefits and other programs normally given to married people are based on your legal, re legally recognized relationship. So if you don't have that type of relationship, how can you avail of insurance benefits? So it will not address that. Um, I would like to encourage companies, however, 
to to allow their employees, you know, uh, if they are in stable, loving relationships, you know, why not? Why not? Why don't these people also get sick? Don't these people, you know, need the benefits of an insurance policy? Just because they're LGBT, do they have lesser needs? I mean, they can't understand that really. Thank you. I think we have another question. Thank you. Uh, my basic questions were asked earlier on the reaction of the church and uh, your new thrust into your new legislative agenda. But I just wanted to make some, share some comments and experience and then one final question on the future. Uh, my name is Al Mayoralgo. I'm a graduate of this school. Our, our family, the Mayoralgos, are from Urani, Padaan. Yes, Kabayan, so. Basically, uh, I want to share an experience because, uh, number one, um, I have a brother who became transgender. And uh, being born in 1954, so by 1960s, my brother was really exposed to a very hardcore masochistic father that he was not able to finish his school and he just had to leave for the States. But I just want to say my experience with persons like him was that there was a lot of talent. They were very good artistically and I think if he was given the chance to really be himself, to be true to himself, he would be more successful. Uh, is she a trans woman? Right now, she, when she went to the state, she went to the process. Okay, so... When she got she, back here, she was... A, you could a, refer to her as a she. Right? Yes, okay, right. My mom. Uh, I, she was a Vicente that became a teen now, right? Okay, but I just wanted to share that I think you're right if people are given a chance to be their true selves. Uh, it's just that I noticed that all my friends in the LGBT community have a certain drive and personality and talent that if they're given the chance and they can really do much better and there, a lot of them are really excelling because they have the drive. Maybe it's the conditions that society besets on themselves, no? And uh, perhaps in your case, uh, that's how you took on the challenge of, of uh, taking this... Acceptance comes a lot, you know. Who I am today would not have been possible if it were not for my loving and uh, parents who accepted me, no conditions. Right. And I, I agree, I think if my, if my, perhaps my father was more accepting that things would have been different. Um, I'm very happy to hear that you're getting into agrarian reform and uh, rural development. So obviously, uh, all of the mental and spiritual stamina that you've nurtured through the years, uh, fighting the LGBT battle will, will really help you in this new battlefield, you know, because this is the heart and core of Filipino society, you know, the feudal structures and, uh, um, and even rural development has something to do about uh, decongesting Metro Manila, adjusting the traffic, new cities, creating a strong middle class in the provinces and leading to your food security, you know, so uh, I just want to say that all the best on what you're, we're trying to, what you're trying to do there is, and good luck because this is where the hardcore conservatives, both economic and political, are. You know? So uh, in light of all of this, your experience, and this is my real question is, do you feel you are able to enable or generate uh, new leaders? Because obviously what you're doing is, it's a trailblazing sort of thing that may not be achieved totally in your lifetime, but I'm sure you are generating new leaders along the way that will carry on the baton. No? Is this, is this happening in your Well, yes, I hope to inspire other people Thank you. of the same condition or members, other members of the LGBT community to follow suit. You know, if I was able to do it, I'm sure you can also do it, right? Make it. And why not? Why not? You know what? Uh, when I won, a lot of members of the LGBT community reached out to me. They were very happy. And I asked them why. Basically, they said that you opened the door, you broke the glass ceiling. So as you said, it's kind of a trailblazing uh, 
uh, feet. But, um, but more than just being transgender, that is not my principal capital. Uh, no. Uh, as usual, and this advice is true for all young people, you have to study hard, you have to know what you want in life, you have to get the, what I said, you know, the skills of empathy and uh, humility and hard work and develop a culture of excellence for you to succeed in life in general. The sad thing though is that despite having these positive traits, some people unfortunately encounter that added challenge of being LGBT because they encounter people who are not accepting of LGBT people. That's when the problem really starts. So yes, I do hope to inspire young people, uh, the millennials, and, um, and yes, it seems that um, uh, they're right, on the right track. They're on the right track. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh